An investigation by four Nordic public broadcasters has claimed that Russian ships were near the site of the explosion that took out the Nord Stream pipeline. However, there are no shortage of theories about who or what was behind the blast, and exactly how would Moscow benefit from destroying its own pipeline? Welcome to the program, I'm Philip Hampshire. The two Nord Stream pipelines built to carry Russian gas to Europe were taken out by underwater explosions last September. The method and perpetrators remain a mystery. Britain, America, Ukraine and Russia, all of them have been accused of being behind the blasts. The latest theory comes from Denmark's DR, Norway's NRK, Sweden's SVT and Finland's YLE channels. Their joint investigation points to Russian vessels that are able to perform underwater operations that were seen near the area in the weeks running up to the blast. But is this theory more likely than any of the others? Joining us to discuss this in Berlin, we have Thomas O'Donnell, who's Global Fellow at the Wilson Center, Washington. He teaches and consults on energy and geopolitics in Berlin. Meanwhile, in Leicester, we have Tara McCormick, who is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Leicester. And from Belfast, we have Alexander Titov, who is a lecturer in modern and European history at Queen's University, Belfast. Thank you very much, for everyone, for joining me. Uh, first of all, just so the viewers are on the same page as all four of us, I'm just going to quickly run through the current five leading theories, because there are five leading theories, as to what happened uh, to the Nord Stream pipelines. Um, the first theory is that Russia may have blown it up. Many analysts in the West believe that Russia was behind the explosions as a way to pressure Ukraine and the West. Theory two, October 29th last year, Moscow accused the UK of being behind the explosions. Theory three, others believe it, that the United States was behind the explosions as a way to weaken Russia's economy and influence. Theory four, Ukraine was behind the explosions as a way to prevent Nord Stream 2 from being completed. Theory five, there is also speculation that a pro-Ukrainian group not linked to any government may have carried out the attack. So, Thomas, um, if this were an Agatha Christie film, we've got five leading suspects here. Are you going to pick one of those five? Do you think it was someone else? Do you think nobody will ever know? Um, <clears throat> I think somebody will know, and I think there's a good likelihood that people may know. The, investi the professional investigators from Denmark, Sweden, and so forth probably have a very good idea. I'd say... If we're going to do an Agatha Christie, we do motive, means, and opportunity, the elements usually uh, in a crime. And, um, you know, uh, the means, all the states have the means. Opportunity, many of the states have the opportunity. But the motive, that's quite interesting. And you've listed a number of motives. I, uh, in talking to professionals, uh, while well, I can tell you the details later, the motive here is Russia needed, gas prime in particular needed, to have a force majeure, uh, open and close force majeure, to stop the responsibility in liability court for having shut off the pipelines. This might equal something in the, in the I asked an expert today, uh, a Norwegian fellow, I could tell you who he is, who negotiated for 30 or 40 years contracts in Europe. He estimated it's up to, eight, if, if the pipeline was still intact and they were refusing to send the gas as they started to refuse, it would be up to 80 or $100 billion now, which is 10 times, at least almost 10 times any previous um, uh, arbitration case of, the of that nature in Europe. And if it would be, you know, without force majeure, they would lose an arbitration court in Stockholm to all the European companies. Liens would be put on all their equipment in Europe and elsewhere, ships, refineries, and so forth. So I think motive means an opportunity. We could talk about it in more detail. Uh, it seems to be Russia. Tara, are you in agreement with that? Would you? Obviously, nobody knows. And that's one of the beauties of discussing a subject like this, is it's hard to label anyone a conspiracy theorist because they're all conspiracy theories, and yet the pipeline still blew up. So if you had to place your, your five pounds on the grand national winner completely in the dark, who do you think might have done it? 
Uh, well, my hypothesis would be that this was an American-led operation uh, conducted, I would imagine, by NATO, NATO member states. Um, we know that the US has been very much opposed to Nord Stream, of course, famously. And of course, you know, these things can mean many things. Famously, Biden uh, said that if Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, Nord Stream would stop. As he famously said this to Schultz, as we know. Uh, so we know the US has been very against Nord Stream from the start. Uh, also, Poland and the Baltic states have been very against uh, Germany increasing its energy relationship with Russia. So that would be my hypothesis. Alexandra, are you going for one of those two? Or are you going to pick another actor in this sort of international Cluedo game? Well, um, I mean, apart from uh, not wanting want to kind of explore all the options, but I do think that um, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, <clears throat> uh, participation in this is probably the most likeliest one, um, again, uh, for um, a variety of reasons, but most importantly is that they um, uh, it's been a big um, uh, bone in the throat, uh, the uh, Nord Stream since its first construction. Uh, it's almost um, the idea of destroying it certainly fits within a lot of rhetoric and thinking uh, in Kiev. Uh, strategically, it destroys the one of the links between Russia and Germany, which will um, satisfy and remove the pressure from Germany to kind of re resume, if, um, if ever comes to it, uh, trade relations with Russia. And I think Ukraine also has a pattern of uh, carrying out very complex and successful operations against uh, Ruff Russian infrastructure, with starting with Kerch uh, Bridge in Crimea, uh, ending up with uh, sea drone attacks on S Sebastopol. Uh, and um, I think uh, overall, uh, it certainly benefits uh, Ukraine. Uh, in terms of severing the links, very important, the most important economic link between uh, Russia and Germany. I think they have a strategic interest in, in destroying it. Now, Ukraine certainly has one of the mo stronger motives. And as you say, the taking out of the Kirsch Bridge, uh, drone attacks on Sevastopol, various other uh, activities across Russia. We've seen a lot of oil refineries mysteriously, spontaneously going up in flames. So Ukraine has to have a big question mark over it. Only this is at the bottom of the sea. Ukraine is not generally regarded as an enormous sea power. It's also on the Baltic. It's uh, on the other side of Europe. Does that not make it logistically quite tricky for you to think Ukraine? Well, I think if you uh, think about uh, how long it would took. So the war started in, September, in February. Uh, that's done in, in, uh, in September. Uh, they could have done planning for it, what we do in the case Russia attacks. You know, they could have been planning it for, uh, for, for many months, if not, uh, uh, if not yet. I and mean, you know, we are they're very daring, very inventive. Uh, very capable of doing something unexpected uh, like that. Uh, details, I mean, uh, if you look at the official pronouncements by uh, the Germans and by the um, uh, U.S. press, all of them extremely pro-Ukrainian, extremely anti-Russian. Uh, if there was any uh, evidence of Russians' involvement, I'm sure they would jump on it. Uh, but the working hypothesis now is that Ukraine did it, but because obviously they don't, don't want to have you know, implicate Ukraine itself in something kind of a major attack on European infrastructure, somebody they're sending weapons, somebody they are sending financial aid, uh, somebody whom they, you know, talk about admitting to European Union and then that country actually blowing up a major infrastructure, uh, European infrastructure. So that's why you have this theory of uh, Ukrainian, but... Uh, you know, non-state non, non affiliated, which, I mean, if you doubt that the Ukrainian state could have done it, but somehow uh, non-Ukrainian state, just a private group able to carry out it, that's, that becomes even more ridiculous. But I, th I, think, I think overall, uh, you know, overall part and, you know, considerations so on and so forth, technical details, yes, but uh, overall, I think kind of so far, Ukraine is the most likely thing so far. Thomas, uh, let me take it across. Thomas, you're shaking your head. You don't like that idea. Well, you know, I, I can't fault my two colleagues here um, for their ideas. You know, given the state of public information, generally public information, you know, reasonable people can have various reasonable points of view. I would say, however, if you talk to people who are in some official or business capacity who know the details of the gas sector in Europe or in government, 
My direct experience is from talking to Ukrainians who worked in the National Gas Company before this and actually just the day after it happened. The whole discussion, uh, especially afterwards, but before as well, was the Russians have no force majeure that's going to hold up in court. Putin wanted to shut off the gas. You know, the Germans said by the end of the year they were going to have cut the flows by two thirds. So if Putin was going to use it as a weapon, he had to shut it off early and cause a, a, a crisis last winter. We're only lucky that it was warm and there wasn't a big crisis. So he tried three times to get a force majeure. The first time he insisted that under the contract he could demand rubles were paid for the gas and uh, most companies refused to do it. That didn't work. Then he said, ah, the compressor is broken and he sent it off to Canada and he said, it's against sanctions, I can't bring it back home. Mr. Schultz, the uh, 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 chancellor here, stood in front of it and said, it's here, you're welcome to it, come and take it, it's repaired. He didn't, and then he claimed that the, uh, well, Gazprom claimed that the compressors online were broken and leaking. Siemens, who would repair those compressors, said it's not necessary to shut them off, this is typical maintenance, you repair them while they're running. By that time, from having shut off the pipeline, he probably owed somewhere between four and $10 billion for not fulfilling long-term contracts that he had broken to many European countries, even forcing countries such as Germany to nationalize their companies because of the impact. By this time, it would be up to perhaps 80 or $100 billion. He had to stop the clock on that liability because what happened, there's no, you know, there's, he had no no claim, legal claim. Uh, so in, in Stockholm, they all would have gone to Stockholm, basically, under the contracts. They would have got a decision, and they would have been able to seize Gazprom's property all throughout Europe, their ships and everything. Now, uh, people in the business, who I'm sure Mr. Zelensky has direct access to, his company would have told him, no, the Russian, no, don't, don't cut it off. They've cut off the gas. And now they're going to have to pay the uh, tremendous amount of money and we can seize their property. And the Americans were quite aware of this fact. The Norwegians, I asked the Norwegians the next day, uh, Mr. Morten Frisch, who wrote contracts, uh, negotiated contracts all over Europe, including with the Russians in the Middle East for 40 years for them. Immediately, he said, force majeure. Putin got a force majeure. Now you got to prove he did it or he's not going to be responsible for breaking all these contracts and all the costs to Europe all the subsidies the countries are giving to their companies now for not having the gas, he's, he's off the hook until that can be proved. So All I right, think Hold it's on, Thomas. Let me come back case. to you. And, uh, let me come back sure. to you on that in just a second. Alexander, um, what do you feel? Uh, sorry. Uh, no, no, but I mean, it's fine. I mean, it's uh, it certainly kind of uh, could be a factor, but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Issue here, of course, is that uh, Russia is already been always uh, 300 billion dollars frozen. Uh, the Gazprom's uh, German um, uh, subsidiary has been uh, nationalized by the German state and so forth. So basically, all the Russian assets in the in the, in the West are only uh, there as long as West wants it to do. Um, and um, uh, the uh, Bottom line is that, uh, yes, it's true, Russia wasn't actually sending any uh, gas through the pipeline already for a, for a couple of um, a couple of months, if I'm not, if not wrong. Uh, and uh, it certainly was um, kind of, uh, uh, stri trying to restrict the supply of gas via Nord Stream for, for a long time now. Uh, going there from uh, kind of blowing it up uh, to blowing it up to hypothetical issue, which is extremely complicated because you have... German authorities, EU regulations banning um, uh, uh, European companies in putting sanctions, uh, Russian state in putting it, how it will stand in court because this is a Gazprom. Gazprom says, well, you know, we could always say that uh, we, we had nothing to do with it because it's both either European Union or the Russian state issuing sanctions, etc. So uh, pl plausible, but I'm not kind of uh, utterly convinced that it's sort of that's the final word because there's so many ins and goings. It's a big thing to do. And I th still think, again, uh, circumstantially, that Ukraine has a lot to gain from it, certainly has the character to do it. Uh, and also, all the um, kind of reports so far has been pointing to, um, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, that said, all the 
incentive on both Europeans and Americans is to blame Russia, and they still haven't produced any uh, any evidence, uh, while also coming having this very kind of far-fetched theory of it's well, it is Ukraine, but it's really not the landscape, and it's sort of it's a private individual. We knew it from the start, etc., etc. Well, let me. So anyway, a possible Russia, uh, but so far, what I can see uh, is that uh, certainly Ukraine is the more likely. I'm disappointed none of you like the Russian theory that it was actually the British that did it in the complete out of left field position that they seem to have taken. Tara, I'm going to come across to you. Um, are you influenced at all by Seymour Hersh's view? Um, Seymour Hersh, let me run through this very quickly for some of the viewers who may not be familiar with him. Seymour Hersh uh, is a US uh, investigative journalist and political writer gained recognition in 1969 for exposing the My Lai Massacre and its cover-up during the Vietnam War, for which he received his 1970 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. During the 1970s, he covered the Watergate scandal for the New York Times. Woodard and Bernstein, of course, broke that for the Post, but he covered it for the New York Times. He also reported on the US's secret bombing of Cambodia, CIA's programming of domestic spying, and in 2004, he was responsible for exposing torture at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq for the New Yorker. Every single time he exposed one of those stories, he was then labeled a conspiracy theorist and a madman. Uh, and yet he has come out with his own theory in which he says it was the United States. And he then leads off on a very long and elaborate ruse as to how he thinks they did it. Were you influenced by him, Tara? Um, well, I've certainly read, of course, as I'm sure we all have, uh, Hirsch's article. Um, but just to correct you, he's not claiming this is his theory. Hirsch is, arg is claiming that this is information okay. he has received rather than that this is hi his hypothesis. He's an investigative um, journalist. He's presented this as fact, as a story. This is what's happened. Yes, and he says, I, you know, I can't remember the exact article I read. You know, th this is based on uh, information that he has. But, I mean, my hypothesis is based on the fact that Ukraine is very obviously a proxy war of uh, Western states, particularly NATO, against Russia. And that a number of things are being, that the war is being used for a number of things. For example, uh, consolidating NATO. Uh, I think we probably all remember, was it two, the 2021 um Munich Security Council theme was, was it 2000? I'm sure my colleagues can tell me, was it 21? You know, Westlessness. You know, and this has been a kind of ongoing uh, malaise, worry, fears that Europe is drifting away, arguments about strategic autonomy, etc. And it seems to me that the Ukraine proxy war uh, is being used to do another, a number of things to bring Britain back into the fold, uh, of European defence post-Brexit. Uh, we've seen Britain very much taking the lead in sending long-range missiles to Ukraine, of course, as my colleagues probably know better than I. Um, and I think also kind of consolidating America, America's position again post-Trump uh, within NATO and American kind of, I'll put in quotes, leadership or hegemony um, over NATO and European defence. We're seeing a kind of natification of the EU defence as well. So I think there are a number of things going on and I that lead me to hypothesise that this is essentially part of this broader proxy war um, and that essentially it is a American NATO operation. Thomas, let me take this back across to you. Um, I assume you are not a fan of Seymour Hersh's story here. Um, because you don't think it was the United States. But Seymour Hersh does have a very strong track record, even though this current story by him, I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, it reads like an Ian Fleming novel. It's very, very outlandish tale that he tells. No, I mean, um, I, would, I would disagree your characterization of Seymour um, earlier in his life. Um, a lot of us did not, we did not, you know, Many people did not think of him as a conspiracy theorist. From what I knew about him for years, he was a competent investigative journalist. What was particularly striking, why I often followed him, uh, his stories, especially when I was, well, the My Lai thing in Vietnam, but later in the Iran uh, uh, nuclear crisis and Iraq issues, was because 
he was known for having inside contacts in the American government, in the Pentagon, State Department, White House, and he would have multiple sources that sort of re, uh, reinforced each other in his stories. And it connected very well with external. And he would publish in places like, uh, well, you're in the business, I don't know, like somebody like Mother Jones or, or the Washington Post, especially Mother Jones, if you try to get an article with them, they hyper check everything. But this is quite different for Seymour Hirsch. And uh, I, to me, it's a little embarrassing after winning Pulitzer Prizes. He self-published this. I heard interviews with him, and I understand what Tara is saying, but actually he made it very clear in the interviews I've seen, lengthy interviews you can see on, on YouTube and other places. He believes this. And he says, well, you know, certain of it, it wasn't even necessary to look for more. It's obvious. Uh, this, it must be the Americans would want to do this. So I... I think it's unfortunate. He didn't, he's not well sourced. And all the open source intelligence that's been done to trace the ships he's talking about, the, the, with the uh, uh, responders on them, turns out they were in other areas at the times he claimed they were there. Some of the military ships he talked to weren't in the right area that he said they were in. So it's pretty well fallen apart. Uh, it should have been better fact checked. Maybe somebody was tricking him. I don't know. Or somebody they thought they knew something. Um, on the other hand, the story I'm saying is, I, I mean, in the business, the people in the gas business and the people in intelligence and so forth, no, I, I'll tell you why this is important to Russia. The Germans had to nationalize the Russian company here, Gazprom Germania. They had to nationalize one of their own companies, Uniper, and, and so forth. Now, they would like to, um, uh, what should I say, they would like to... Um, just take that because Russia started a war and cut off the gas. But under the German constitution, they're going to have to compensate Russia. Now, um, once Russia got force majeure on their pipelines, okay, for uh, because they would have lost in liability court, now that stops the, uh, what should I say, that stops the ability of Russia to have these things taken for liability claims in arbitration court. And I, uh, in response to Alexander, this is a lot of money, and this is their, all their infrastructure, uh, in, infrastructure in Europe and anywhere else in the world that some court would respect the decision in Stockholm. So it, it is a big deal, I would say, for the Russians. And that other money is seized. They think they're going to get it back at some point when the war is over in negotiations. This is a big deal for them. Other countries knew it was a big deal for them. I don't see why anybody else would gift it to them. Hold on. Uh, uh, let me take it across from you, Thomas Alexander. Well, I mean, yes. If, uh, I mean, it's potentially a big deal. We, we simply don't know uh, how things will develop. I think they, they written off the, all the money others in the world. There's uh, so much as uh, Russian as has been frozen, and now some of them are being actually uh, confiscated as well. Uh, so, I mean... In normal circumstances, that would make sense. But, I mean, we're not living in normal circumstances. This is a uh, kind of total rupture between Russia and the West. Uh, I mean, not just Gazprom assets, but Russian state sovereign assets have been frozen and likely to be at some point um, uh, be confiscated if, I mean, the, the European Union is openly saying we're trying to find a way of confiscating them and so forth. Uh, Canada is already doing it. Uh, United States starts doing it for individuals and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, valid, uh, a valid point. Uh, I mean, I would also say that, you know, that would, go, of course, goes for, go for Nord Stream 1, but doesn't, you know, Nord Stream 2 wasn't actually an operation, and it's, Force Majeure doesn't apply to it at all. So, and they did blow up one of the uh, uh, pipelines, you can say, oh, they're just they're looking for an alibi. I mean, but it's it's so all those things are possible and probable. I'm just taking on the basis of overall evidence and the pattern of behavior and um, motives. For me, Ukraine is, seems to be by far the most likely um, uh, um, uh, candidate for that. And again, uh, if there was suggestion of kind of firm evidence of Russia or more evident than Ukraine, they would have seized on it. European Union and um, uh, all the Western governments and investigations and so forth would, would be out there. They haven't done it. You know, they, they still the working theory uh, is the um, uh, is the um, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian um, uh, traces 
uh, the only one we really have a concrete investigation was uh, some yachts uh, in in uh, uh, in a German port and so forth, uh, which has some traces of explosives in it, etc., etc. So uh, yeah, I mean we're not going to come to a conclusion. Yeah, right. Hold, we simply don't. No. hold on, Alexander. We're not. Uh, you're totally right. Uh, we're running out of time. Let me quickly take it across to Tara. Tara, part of the problem here is there doesn't seem to have been very much open discussion on this. It's almost like any time the subject's brought up in the newspapers, it's like, shh, stop bringing up conspiracy theories. I mean, uh, and I, do, I agree with Alexander here. I mean, the response has been incredibly muted. This was, you know, an absolutely major piece of European infrastructure. Um, and the response has been incredibly muted, which is another reason I have to agree with um, Alexander that, you know, supports an argument that this was not Russia. No one wants to talk about it. I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary. You know, this incredible act of sabotage blowing up uh, how many 15, how much did it cost to build 15 billion pounds, maybe more. Um, a key part of Germans, Germany's um, energy security. Really sorry, that's all we have time for today on today's show. Very disappointed none of you pointed the finger at Denmark either, since they were so nearby. I did read a wonderful theory about how it was all the Danes secretly trying to get back at the Germans. But that's all we have time for today. It's been a pleasure having all three of you on the show. I'm afraid that is all the time we have for discussion and debate, but if you want to see more of it, head on over to our YouTube channel and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, thank you for watching and goodbye.